salve para você que se liga aqui no canal do TF. Tem, olha só quem tá do meu lado aqui hoje, olha só. Olha aqui, o moço aqui, ó. Vai bater um papo conosco aqui, com o Tiaguinho Quintela aqui embaixo, ajudando na, nas traduções, porque I'm not speaking English. No, my English is no good. <risos> Mas <risos> o John, como é uma pessoa maravilhosa, ele aceitou que a entrevista fosse feita com um grande tradutor, que é meu amigo Tiago Quintela. A gente vai bater um papo. Essa entrevista ela vai ficar na íntegra no Botafogo, no coração com o Tiago Franklin. E partes dela estarão também no canal do TEF. Estou muito feliz de ter a companhia do John aqui, é, com o Oscar ali do lado. né? Daqui a pouco eu quero perguntar para ele, para iniciar aqui, qual troféu ele quer colocar ali em relação ao Botafogo na sua prateleira. Obrigado, John, por ter aceito o convite. Seja bem-vindo aqui ao canal. E as primeiras considerações do nosso rapaz que trouxe a esperança para nós torcedores botafoguenses. Well, I, I think um, I've said it a few times. I mean, it, it was very unexpected. You know, I started looking at Brazil football. Um, I grew up in South Florida. I've, I've said this a few times lately because I, I think people in Brazil understand this about Florida, but it's very different as a state in the United States. It's very connected to South America. Um, And so growing up here, going to a big public school, you know, seeing many different, you know, cultures and subcultures coming out of South America, uh, race here, which is a very topical thing now, was not really anything you'd notice too much growing up in South Florida because people from Colombia, uh, Peru, Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, I mean, this was your society when you're growing up in Florida. So. Um, you know, you didn't really see much of a difference. And so as a soccer player, um, globally a football player, um, you know, I was one of the few gringos on the team. And, um, you know, we had a great appreciation for the fact that people from South America often came, you know, with much more connection to soccer than we had up here in the United States. And so you had this respect Uh, for the great, great teams and national teams of South America. So it's not that abnormal. People say, well, why, you know, Brazil? Like, you know, I grew up in Florida. But Brazil's always been huge. And now to be invited into this historic moment where the government had made a decision to allow this separation of the, the football clubs from the social clubs, you know, anytime somebody invites you to participate in a moment of time where a country and a culture or an industry changes, I mean, it's an incredible opportunity. You know, we can just go do normal business or you get to be my age, I'm 56, you start to think about legacy projects, things that are really important. And this is one of those. Um, it's not that unexpected that I would be looking there because again, growing up in Florida, we're very connected to South America, Texas and California, maybe more so connected to Mexico in Central America, but Florida is very, very much a South Florida connection. Um, so I'm honored. Uh, you know, I I, uh, I cannot believe they're writing articles where I'm in the same article with Ronaldo, the great Ronaldo. And people, I, I tell people this, friends around Florida, they're like, oh, Cristiano Ronaldo? And I'm like, no, no, the original <laughs> Ronaldo, right? So. I mean, for me to see him go first with Cruzeiro and be the real champion of this next era of Brazilian football, I think that's very, very appropriate, regardless of what your favorite club affiliation is or what you thought about where he put, like it's really important that he went first. And to be invited to do that second behind the great Ronaldo, I mean, it's, obviously it's a dream come true for me. Perfect. I, I, I totally agree with you, John. And and, and Tiago just uh, answered to you too about this uh, Oscar you have on, on, on the table. Oh. And, and which trophies <laughs> can uh, join uh, with Oscar on the table? <laughs> well, for the record, that is a replica of an Oscar. The actual, okay. the actual Academy Award that that's a replica of, when you have the company And mm -hmm. you win an Academy Award as a company. It's the the artists, the actual employees that get to take the Oscar home. Mm -hmm. So if you're chairman, owner of the company, you just get a, a replica. Okay. Um, but that was for the curious case of Benjamin Button, great film with Brad Pitt. And so the company had about eight Academy Awards. 
none of which came home with me. They all go with the artists, which is, that's appropriate. It'd be like if Botafogo wins a great championship and gets a great trophy, it's going to go with the players and the coach. It will not come back to my office here. So anyway, um, perfect. So we, are in search. we are in search of trophies, right? So, perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect, John. And and talking about yesterday, uh, you made an important announcement when you decide to stop the contracts of all sponsors. And what kind of sponsors do you expect for Botafogo? Are there uh, already some conversations going on? Yeah, well, one, I want to put in context exactly what that was. It's it's nothing against those sponsors, the types of companies they are or anything. It's just we have a chance to start out with a, a blank canvas. And before we become what we want to become, we have to define who we are and we have to set goals for this club. We have to project that to the globe. Like if we want to become a global power in the world of football, uh, we need to start acting like it right away. And the most important thing we have, one, it's going to be happening on the pitch, on the field, but for everything off the field, how we convey our brand to the world, you know, how we appear, players, coaches, fans, you know, how we present ourselves to the world is how we begin defining the standards of becoming a champion. So I wanted to take this opportunity to clean the slate of all sort of contracts and relationships of the past that are not consistent with what we want to be in the future. Starting with the uniform, like what goes opposite the badge, our hearts. I understand what advertisers want. They want to be noticed. We may have great companies that are sponsors, but I have to sort of get out of these old relationships. Maybe with some of these sponsors, we enter into new relationships where we set the standards for the color, the size, and the placement of the logos that we allow to be opposite and to take advantage of sharing the front of the jersey with, with our badge. So that's really all that was. It's just like resetting and going forward. In terms of what the uniform should look like, you know, look at the Premier League, look at La Liga, look at uh, Bundesliga. They don't have like 10 out like of a bunch of colors. piece of real estate, <laughs> yeah. right? It's about the club. You've got a big, big value on the chest. Your sponsor that gets the main shirt sponsor, you get a sleeve sponsor. You look at my company, uh, which is a sleeve sponsor at uh, Crystal Palace. Well, we get a lot of value out of that because the, the, the jersey is not loaded up with advertisements all over the front and the back. And we will end up having fewer sponsors on the jersey and maybe they pay a bit more. Now, every dollar or reais that we bring in to the club is going to go to the players and what we want to build, right? So I hope the fans support me when we do something commercial, when we try to make better uh, economic decisions off of our sponsor. I think we might actually sell more uniforms if we have fewer sponsors, because I want more people wearing the Botafogo jerseys around the world, outside of Brazil, thinking about us in Brazil. It may seem like I've given away a lot of money. I do have to pay a lot of cancellation fees. So it cost me a lot of money to do that yesterday. Mm -hmm. But it's really important for what we want to become. John, por falar em uniforme, o Botafogo há alguns anos teve essa camisa aqui. É você como uma pessoa que é ligada ao futebol, conhece várias camisas. Como você avalia esse uniforme que o Botafogo teve há alguns anos? Somebody sent that to me on Twitter, and I couldn't believe there was an actually a price. The price, yeah. Right. And the price had changed. <laughs> yeah. the, the the price changed the uh, the first half to the second half. It's no, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Really, the team <laughs> I swear going at halftime and change their yeah. jerseys. Yeah, yeah. The, that I think it was uh, our nightmare, like uh, yeah, yeah. wearing a, a Botafogo shirt. Look, you really you want to ask your sponsors to respect who you are and what you're trying to convey, and so you want to get logos where the color is if not white or black it's with another color that works well with white or black and we will ask our sponsors to conform to our standards not the other way around and we will not expect our players to be you know advertisements we expect our players to be players até o brasileiro você já espera John ter pelo menos um fornecedor de material esportivo na nova camisa do Botafogo we don't have the urgency that other clubs have that I need the money in by a certain date. Um, you know, this first year is going to be very expensive just to transition. We want to put our money towards the squad. You know, we're looking at a number of situations in terms of the new uniform supplier. We want to get shirts available to the fans to wear. Bringing a whole new supplier in this late is going to be uh, difficult. So, you know, I do have relationships with some very big companies. 
that will be given a chance to look at this. One of my partners, for example, owns uh, Reebok and he's a shareholder in Eagle Football, one of my true, true partners in football. So, you know, certainly I'm going to ask them what their thought is. They're not in the football business right now, but they're thinking of re-entering. So maybe they could do so with us. You know, Reebok was purchased from Adidas. So uh, our relationships uh, there are quite good. Same with uh, Nike and Puma and others. You know, it's uh, it's quite possible that my focus in the early going, yeah, we could end up doing our own thing, private label under the Botafogo brand until we find the right relationship going forward and do some fun special edition kind of uh, shirts for the fans that people would enjoy that are almost, imagine that, a, a limited edition jersey that really reflects this moment in time when this transition into a new era began. So we could have some fun with that, but I'm not going to rush a commercial decision because we need money to show up at a certain time. I'd be happy to see the entire team dressed in ballerina outfits if they just win a championship, right? I mean, it's about the football. It's not about anything else. And so we have to get that right first. We have to invest in the players, have to invest in the team. And yeah, we'll probably have identified our, our, you know, significant supplier, one of the big brands that fans will like. But if we identify them in time to avoid disruption of uh, shirts available for the fans at the beginning of the season, you know, that it's going to be difficult. We have a lot to do in February and March to get this done. It's very hard to do. But I wasn't given a chance to make the, this decision earlier. You know, I was only given that chance to make that decision this week. And all the advice would be, don't change. My God, the season's there on April 1st. And uh, I'm sure they're perfectly nice people there, but, but they didn't line up with our strategy going forward. And so I had to change, even if it means it will be late on some things as we start the season. John, é, o torcedor botafoguense, eu sei que acho que das um milhão de mensagens que você recebe nas redes sociais, 999.999 são em relação às contratações. E você também fez algumas mudanças importantes dentro do departamento de futebol. Eduardo Freeland ganhou uma promoção, agora vai trabalhar numa área estratégica. Enderson Moreira é, acabou sendo demitido. O Botafogo busca um novo treinador. Eu gostaria de entender, John, essas mudanças. Qual é a sua visão em relação a esse Botafogo? Você concedeu uma entrevista ao, ao GE falando né, que você quer um, uma escola do Botafogo desde a base, com jogadores sendo é, formados, um padrão tático já meio que é, é, vindo lá de trás, o Botafogo tendo essa, essa escola. E como você viu a chegada do Mazuco, do André Mazuco, e também do Anderson para ajudar ali no departamento de scout, e também como que você planeja esse Botafogo já para a temporada de 2022? So, um, let me explain the football department. I mean, first of all, as I explain the football department, it, it, I probably should first touch on uh, Eduardo uh, Freeland. Mm -hmm. So, okay. very, very high quality man. Um, I met him, I liked him the first moment I talked to him. Um, you know, these sort of ridiculous stories about me being upset by a translator showing up at a meeting you know, what's Eduardo supposed to do? Of course, he needs to show up with a translator. I'm the American showing up in Brazil. I'm the one who doesn't speak the language, right? So, um, but the the conversations I had with him from the first day of training, when we were together on the field that day, to uh, we were at Andre Chame's house as well on an important day when we signed contracts, to follow-up calls, to every time I've asked him a question, uh, I get an answer. I get very good data back. I, I see a very, very good, uh, committed, uh, faithful employee to the organization. So um, there was never a situation where I didn't see him being a part of our future. Um, I do think that his background, uh, his relationships, you know, fit very well to what I see as a global plan to build academies and to build relationships uh, around the world, starting in Brazil and starting in Florida with a Botafogo Academy in Florida that, you know, matches the standard that we see in, in Europe. And so he's the right person for this job. There are many people that could fit the sporting director job, but given his relationships, his history, his origin in the youth academy, I had a very strong employee that I knew was right for this job. So hopefully working with the Marrera Celis brothers on some of the ideas they've had, 
um, where Eduardo's relationships are very good there as well. Traveling as he is this week with me to London to sort of see the Crystal Palace facility and see other facilities. Um, he just was really the right person for this. And it's, um, so that's the decision we made with Freeland. Uh, as far as the sporting director, you know, one thing that Eduardo doesn't really have are relationships that, that are not only within Brazil, but well beyond Brazil. And so the job of the sporting director among many managing the football department and these types of things is to be liked, well-known and well-respected well beyond Brazil. So he creates the broadest possible universe of player selection that we can get where somebody, look, the fans are very good at pointing out people that are available in the newspaper. And sometimes those are great decisions, but a sporting director who has a friend in the Red Bull organization that has a friend in Liverpool knows about a player that none of us even think about. And that's a much better decision than maybe the, the terrific uh, Oscar Romero or Elkison, right? So the sporting director has to have those relationships. And I feel very comfortable, not with his wins and losses and his other clubs, but I feel comfortable with his relationships. He's a good critical thinker. The way he makes decisions, I think I like a lot. Um, but I'm not an owner that is, it's not a club association, a social association anymore, where maybe the guy you hire for sporting director has to have a perfect undefeated track record, right? Well, that's, but if I'm involved directly, I don't, I care about all of his experience, you know, success and failure. Failure has been my greatest teacher, right? Show me somebody that's never failed and I'll show you an idiot who just got lucky, right? <laughs> So I think experience, the good and the bad of it, is what you, you look for in a key employee. Now, he creates the universe of possibilities. Then Alessandro Brito is head of scouting, market intelligence, analysis, data, video. And it's great that he comes from an organization where they've been looking at top, top players as they built Atletico Monero to their championship. So who else do you want to come in and say, what do you know? Who do you have? Who's in Brazil? Who's available, right? And as we bring this big universe of players that I'm helping to bring, that our friends at Crystal Palace are helping to bring, that, uh, that, that Andre is helping to bring, well, Alessandro is going to have a really critical role in helping us make the right decisions, along with the coaching staff that comes in with the European construction and the style of play that I think has proven very, very successful around the world. The, the European game has evolved well beyond the Brazil game where the great talent and artistry and creativity of the Brazil players, you know, are very good when they plug in to these European systems. It's why Bayern Munich looks so good against Benfica, right? It's why teams with no talent that are playing in different countries in Eastern Europe are still incredible. The system, the way they spread the ball around and build from the back. Like, so this is, um, this is why these decisions were made. In the case of Anderson, you have to be crazy to fire a coach with a 72% winning record unless the system that you are trying to build for long-standing success uh, is unlikely to be delivered through that particular coach. Now, anybody can hire Anderson, and they will, I assume, very quickly. He's a good man, a very talented man, and any coach with his capabilities can grab a bunch of players and make them play out of their minds and they can win. But we're not just looking for that. We're looking to build the Botafogo way. When people see us play, you know, they'll say, oh, I get it, I understand it. Like Barcelona plays their system, PSG, Manchester City. So in five years, 10 years, I want people to look at other teams and say, oh, you play like Botafogo. Like I want it to be understood from academy all the way through the system, what we're trying to achieve. And I think this group of people is the right way to do that right now. You're building a new philosophy it's like that, right? I want to dominate possession. I want to demoralize opponents because they can press all they want. They don't get the ball. They get tired of pressing. They get tired of running after you because the ball is gone before they get there. I want to break them down systematically I watched a Benfica, uh, you know, Bayern, which I've talked about many times because I was there at the game, uh, the first leg of their UEFA group stage with them. And it was, uh, it was beyond the group stage. It's, 
I mean, it was only, look, you saw in the first minute how the game was going to end. It wasn't if, but it was when they would break them down and destroy them. And the game was very close at halftime. And everybody in the stadium, everybody knew that it was only a matter of time before this machine of Bayern. Maybe their athletes were not superior, but their system was superior. Um, and uh, I would dream to be able to to see that at Botafogo. We will. John, <laughs> é. John em relação a técnico, Luiz Castro é o nome que o Botafogo gosta, que você gosta, no caso. É, a negociação como que anda é o técnico que você acha que é o bom nome para conduzir esse processo. E outra pergunta até mesmo para a gente entrar nessa, nessa esfera. Você espera até o Campeonato Brasileiro que o Botafogo tenha quantos jogadores diferentes destes atuais? É que o Botafogo esteja com o time com quantas novas peças? E você já espera anunciar novos atletas nos próximos dias? I mean, I'm the coach, Thiago. Congratulations, you were probably the first to sort of put that out there. I will tell you it was way early when you did. You know, Luis Castro is certainly one of my favorites because I've studied the academy development in Portugal, Benfica's academy. And the reason Luis Castro became one of my favorites early, uh, certainly not the only coach that we're talking to, but it's that he's not just a coach. You know, he's he's been a teacher, a teacher of systems. He's very responsible for developing the technical standards of the FC Porto Academy and affecting the style of play of FC Porto. Luis and other coaches in his position have also proven to be very adaptable where they've been able to take those systems into different playing styles. You know, we don't have a deal with him yet. You know, we have talked to more than just Luis Castro. Uh, we expect to make a coaching announcement in the next seven days. And I think that'll be in enough time that I can bring the desires of that staff together with the philosophy that we have as a club um, with Andre and with Alessandro and with the help I'm getting from our friends at Crystal Palace to start getting players that plug into that system. As far as the Rio State Championship, I mean, You know, it's a shame this very important special moment of transformation happens at a time when we all would like to be winning these classics. We're building not just an A team, but also a B team. So even though we have a chance to get out of contracts right now, we chose not to get out of any player contracts. We're keeping all the players. Those that are good enough to compete for the first team will be encouraged to do so. The rest, uh, we'd like them to stay with us and develop on the B team because you never know what happens in the life of a young man when they see the right coaching, the right system. Some of the players that might not be doing well for us now in this system might do well in, in the new system. So it's important that we build out a B team, a U23 and then a U20. So expect me to start shoving players in the direction of Botafogo, but please don't overreact. We may bring some other people where the first signings you see might be players that are built for the B team, not the A team. But I expect somewhere between six or eight signings for the A team before the main season starts in April. John, é, hoje no Brasil existe um pequeno problema de legislação futebolística que você só pode ter cinco jogadores estrangeiros. E no seu pensamento de um Botafogo global, isso pode ser um dificultador? E outra, você pensa em um world class no Botafogo ainda nesse ano? Yeah, I mean, I'm not concerned about the limit. You wouldn't bring in a foreign player unless you knew they were going to be very good. Oftentimes, these foreign players have higher salaries because of the leagues they've been playing in. So, um, I'm not too worried about that limit. Also, keep in mind, I'd have the ability to bring in foreign players for the B team, for the U23s, the U20s as well. And at any given time, if my best five foreign players are on the A team, and that's my limit, that's fine with me, right? I'm not worried about that at all. That's the second part of your question. Um, yeah, oh, so world-class player. A world-class player, yeah. Like Marcelo, for example. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I... I Cavani, you know, Suarez. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I... I no, I mean, Marcelo, I... Yeah, I, gosh, amazing. We love him, right? One of my favorites I love. He'll come back to South America one day, Cavani, Edison Cavani. Yeah, I'm going to try for all those, right? Because I think we have the ability... If any of those players are truly open-minded to coming back, we have more tools to recruit them than others do. Because it's not just Botafogo, it's Eagle football. It's We have the ability to compensate people, not only as players, but uh, you know as celebrities. Um, and we can help them transition into their post-competitive careers. Uh, but you have to understand that most times when you're talking about a player like a Marcelo, Like he's been out of this 
country for how long? Which means he's got a wife and he's got kids in school and he has, you know, it's, it's, it, he may want to come back, but his family, it might not be right for his family. And that may be true of a, and I'm, I'm not talking about him specifically. I don't know him, but that's true of every great Brazilian player or great European player that we want to come here because we're excited to see them play. Well, they have kids, wives. It's not always so easy. John, em relação à estrutura, para a gente chegar aqui na reta final, já que o John colocou um tempo para a gente conversar, é, o Botafogo, uhum. você foi no estádio Newton Santos, gostou do estádio, porém disse até é, uma frase que você colocou em uma das entrevistas, é que precisava de uma mão de tinta, o estádio é bonito, mas precisava de um ajuste. E além disso, o Botafogo tem uma deficiência na estrutura, só tem ali os jogadores no profissional treinam no campo anexo e tem o CT Lunier, que está em construção, que ele pode ser para a base. O que você pensa em relação ao estádio Newton Santos e também para a, o centro de treinamento para os profissionais e também para a base? Você vai fazer dois ou pretende ajustar o Newton Santos? You know, I don't know much about the... I'll start with the training center first. I don't know much about the physical dimensions of it. You know, I was there. Um, the land is beautiful. You know, it's... Uh, It has some unique challenges in terms of the topology, the levels, like how many fields you can get in there. Um, it's my understanding that that's really for the academy and an educational facility. Um, it's very important that from an academy perspective, we have all of the age groups like in one facility. It's much more efficient and much more inspiring and much more successful for an academy to do it that way. Um, it's also nice to have the professional team very nearby, but not not necessarily separate. It has to be, I mean, not, not together, but separate. Sometimes it's really neat when the first team people come by the academy. It's very inspiring to the younger kids. Um, so ideally, I mean, I, there's just so much I have to learn about property in Rio de Janeiro and real estate. And I have to come back down when the deal is not happening. And I've just got to figure all this out. I want to get the kids playing together. I want to get the first team playing near the academy. It's also efficient as a business organization to have them nearby because you you have common employees, medical, physical, all that stuff. Um, and you know it's going to be hard, um, but we've got to figure it out. And we've got you know some great opportunities near Lanier, but um, we've got to look at it as far as the stadium. You know, I have to learn more about what the fans really want, right? I mean, I really, really do because, you know, the stadium, as big and wonderful as it may be, you know, it can't be empty all the time. It's got to be a great place to, it's got to be easy to get to. It's got to be wonderful to watch a game there. It can't be so far away from the field. Just look at Crystal Palace, right? We've got this old, you know, stadium with, only 25,000 seats, but the fans are right on top of the field. The energy there is crazy, right? You know, the, fan, the, the guy scores a goal and he's immediately hugging the fans and they're all over and they're supportive. If you score a goal and you run to the fans at, at Botafogo, you fall into a 12 foot deep moat before you even get to the stadium. I mean, to, to and so, I mean, we got to fix that somehow. And at least while we're there, we have to find a way to build some stands at the end behind the goals. It's going to look weird, right? But we got to get the fans closer. So I worry about that. I I want the energy of a packed stadium with people. I want it to be easy for them to get to. I want it to be affordable. Uh, and I want them to be close to the action. And you guys would have to tell me, you know, can that happen there? Will people go? Do we need to start thinking in the future about building our own stadium? You know, where, I mean, if I were, that's someday in the future, I would actually, I wouldn't be worried so much about the number of seats. I'd be thinking about the closeness of seats, you know, noise, energy. So it's, it's, it's a concern for sure. Sure, sure. But sure. the, the fans say it's our home. Had... It's our home, yeah. right? So yeah. that's important. So the first thing is, can we make our home better? Can we make mm -hmm. our home good enough to really be good for the fans? I mean, this is one of the real decisions 
where the fans and ownership are perfectly aligned, right? We have to figure it out for each other. You're thinking uh, the, the stadium for the fans, not only for business, just um, for example, like in United States, when you have the stadium being part of uh, the, the, the profits of the club, because you have a lot of uh, uh, bars and families come in and like you, you, you pass, uh, I think all the time, I, I think it, um, uh, not only watching the game, but, but I think it's, it, in Brazil is different, right? I think you, you are you are thinking uh, on Brazilian way to see football, right? Well, of course, but it, like I think I don't know. I don't. When you start talking about big stadiums in the United States, like generally, they all work the same way as well. The the more money the stadium makes, the more you can put into your team, the more successful is the team. That's not always true, but um, in this case. One of the most important things I think we can do is give more energy to the players. You know, competitively, we need to develop a home field where we can protect our home field. We can win at our home field. That has to be the one place where the players walk out and they just feel comfortable and ready and they feel supported. So that's number one. Number two, from a television perspective, there's a lot of conversation about that right now in Brazil. Now that private investors and companies are coming in to invest, it's all about television rights. It's all about technology-driven consumer apps, you know, people digesting Botafogo around the world. So it doesn't look so good if we say we're the glorious, most traditional, greatest club, and we have an empty stadium. So how do we, how do we sell that to the world and say we're one of the great global clubs? Because the great global clubs, they have full stadiums, people there every game. So, you know, it's important that we, more than anything, you say it's not about money, it's about the fans. It's about everything. If the, if the fans fill up the stadium, the team has energy. They're more likely to be more successful. The television is going to be better. That means more money to the league, more money to the team. And, you know, we own this club to be more successful competitively. Nobody takes profits out of a club like this. Whatever profits you make, you reinvest and reinvest and reinvest in the club until you become champion. I'll worry about taking money out after we've won the championship, right? <laughs> like, uh, but that, that never happens, right? Whatever you make, you reinvest in the team. So I, I want to see a stadium that's active. You know, if I've got to give free tickets away for kids, 12 year old kids that show up, the future generation of Botafogo supporters, I'll do it. I'm not going to give free tickets away to like 35 year old men with jobs, but we'll give free tickets away to 12 year olds and maybe the 35 year old man that drives them to the game. <laughs> but um, I, we got to fill the stadium. We got to make it a place of incredible energy. And right now it's Milton Santos. It is for our future. Um, but long term, you know, we'll see. We've got to make this right long term. John, nos Estados Unidos, o futebol feminino é muito é, desenvolvido. Campeões olímpicos, mundiais, ganha, ganhar o mundial. E aqui no Brasil, o futebol feminino está em construção. E o Botafogo também. Você já chegou a elogiar a Giovana como um grande talento do time botafoguense. Eu gostaria de saber o que você vai fazer com o futebol feminino do Botafogo. Quais são, quais são os seus planos? É de transformar também as meninas do Botafogo em exemplo, em exemplos para o mundo todo? Um, yeah, I was asked this question once before, and it's, um, you know, the the best answer to this comes when I fully understand what girls and women of Brazil that play football want to achieve with their football. So I can say on its face, the women's game is very important to me. You know, I, I'm from the United States. The women's game is better than the men's game. It has been for many, many years. The great memories of international play, it's not the men's team, it's the women's team. It's Mia Hamm playing against Marta, right? And, you know, we always saw the Brazil team, Marta in particular, as being the greatest ever within this game that I remember. And so those great traditions of women's football that we feel here in the United States are certainly shared in Brazil. And so I think that's a great, great opportunity. Um, we have to have a strategy for women's football. 
Uh, and so where it will start, um, we will announce in the coming weeks a Botafogo Academy in Florida, right? We already have a school. We'll build out of the SC Florida Prep Academy, which we already have. We'll begin to identify what Botafogo in Brazil needs to get out of the United States. Identification of players, commercial relationships, building a bridge between Brazil and the United States, which is one of the best commercial markets in the world. It's a great opportunity for Botafogo. So if we're going to do that at the Botafogo Academy, you have, I mean, the women's program is going to be stronger than the men's program. Now, in the United States, girls use football to get into college and university. That's the principal goal of being in women's football. A very small percentage want to go pro, but you know, when you have these great colleges like Duke University, one of our, you know, girls locally here, she was just signed by Duke. Um, you know, that, that's their goal to go to college. So I don't know what the goal is for a young woman in Brazil. Is it to use her football to go to university or is it to use her football to become professional? Um, only with that answer can you really know what strategy to build. And I don't know that yet. I can just tell you, I promise you, like women's football is hugely important to me. It's hugely important in the United States. Um, and it's the one place where the United States is a leader around the world. And somehow that's got to help put the fogo. John, é, Jorge Braga, CEO, te ajudou totalmente no projeto, fez uma, um trabalho bem interessante de reconstrução do Botafogo. Quais seus planos para ele em relação ao Botafogo SAF? Não, é... It's his choice. I've told him I want him to be a part of Botafogo SAF. Um, and it's clear that he's done a great job. A lot of the hard work of, you know, when a club goes from first level down to second level, the very difficult decisions he had to make to, you know, to keep the club going, to reduce headcount, to be very careful with the club's money, to put it in the right places. You know, he's done a fabulous job. So I've invited him to be the CEO of Botafogo SAF, but you know he's a very good and honest broker within this transaction. His loyalty right now still is to the club, and he's been very good about. He has to negotiate against me on little items, right? It it's not really against because those were just in the early days, right, when we were doing the big contract. But even now that the contract is done. You know, there are trade-offs that have to happen between what's club responsibility, what's our responsibility, how we deal with those responsibilities. So he still works for the club, uh, doesn't yet work for me. And hopefully, you know, if we get this all finished up, you know, say within seven to 10 days, I'm going to be coming to Brazil on the 21st. Um, I'll be arriving back in Rio. Then, you know, hopefully very soon he comes fully over into the SAF. Um, but right now he's doing a good job finishing his work for the club. John, é, você espera assinar o contrato nessa semana ou na semana que vem para de vez é, você assumir as operações do Botafogo? Uh, yeah, that's why I'm coming back to Brazil. I mean, the lawyers have a lot of work to do. Like most of the big agreements have been made, the business terms, but it's quite a complicated process setting up entities in Brazil. There are things that I have to do to be qualified, you know, to be able to invest in Brazil. And, you know, this it's statutory government kind of process, but we hope to be done, you know, early next week. Okay. Agora uma brincadeira com o John. John, você tem postado no Twitter, no teu site, no começo da madrugada. É para a gente dormir um pouco mais cedo e colocar o celular para despertar por volta de meia-noite, uma hora da manhã aqui no Brasil, porque as novidades sempre serão nesses horários. O torcedor do Botafogo está querendo saber isso nas redes sociais. Você tem que colocar o celular para despertar um pouco no começo da madrugada. Yeah, I know. I saw there was uh, one person who sent me a message last night. She said it was hard to go to bed with information raining in. And uh, so I apologize for that. Um, You know, the end of my work day, it's, you know, things are slowing down. I realize, you know, there's something that I need to communicate and I don't really think you guys are two hours later. So I'll try to keep that in mind in the future. But this That's poor no young problem. woman, I think she got to bed very late because I'm like, don't worry, nothing else is going to be said tonight. 
It's, you can go to bed. <risos> Aqui no Brasil tem um ditado, dormir é para os fracos. Yeah. <risos> João, obrigado é, pela entrevista, pelo papo. Eu acho que foi mais do que uma entrevista, um papo entre pessoas que querem o bem do Botafogo. Você veio com essa visão. Isso é muito importante. E minha última pergunta. É, há um ano, o torcedor botafoguense não poderia imaginar que no começo de 2022 nós estaríamos com uma luz no final do túnel, uma esperança de ver o Botafogo tão bem como está em suas mãos. Como você planeja o Botafogo daqui a um ano? Onde você quer ver o Botafogo no começo de 2023? Hum, uau! Eu mean, I can't imagine going through what the fans went through this past year. We have we have relegation in the UK and you know for mid-table clubs in England it's always kind of on your mind right at the beginning of the season until you get to a point where you get to safety um you know the top of the league is dominated in the UK by teams with massive budgets and so those top four to six positions are very hard to sort of break into and then the bottom three positions you know are relegated so you really only have you know eight or so positions of safety um and in brazil i think i think you know we have an opportunity because we actually are one of the clubs that have access to capital we have not only great traditions, we have great fans. Um, we're not going to spend, you know, on salaries the very first year, what the top one or two teams are spending. But, you know, we're going to get our player budget and salaries up over 100 million reais this year, which is, I don't know, that's probably, I don't know, what is that? Probably five times what it was last year. I don't really know the salaries last year, but so, you know, we're certainly going to be spending more. We're going to be building to try and achieve a, a mid table or higher finish this year. Um, everything's going to have to go, you know, beautifully for that to happen. The players that we bring in have got to come together with good chemistry. Um, but I hope what people feel is that we are at a place of safety that relegation is off the table, that that fear is not a fear that our fans should feel. Now, I'm going to feel that fear from the very first game, right? Because you're bringing a whole lot of things together and it doesn't always come together and gel perfectly. You can bring the best 11 players on the planet together and, you know, whether they have chemistry together remains to be seen. Only in time do you see that. So... Um, but know that it's a long season, you know, and there's also a second window, right? Which allows you to get right what you may not have gotten right in the first window. And so the money we're spending, we're going to pour it on a little bit in the first window. We're going to hope that we make nothing but perfect decisions, but that never happens, right? So we have the second window where we get to make adjustments um, and we're going to keep investing and keep pushing and keep pushing so that we can move up the table. So hopefully when you say, what do they feel like a year from now? I hope that last year is just a forgotten memory that we're so far away from that feeling of risk that, that they don't even think about it. Um, so that's, that's my hope. John, so, thank you. Uh, very good. Uh, good luck. Em relação ao my so English, ó, my English very yeah. good. Very good. Good luck. Joel you know Santana how to say. English. Joel Santana English. Yeah, no, Tiago Franklin knows how to say several things in English. Like, good luck, win championships, and go Botafogo, right? So, yeah, perfect English. He will, he will start a, a lesson, a English lessons uh, for, uh, I think, uh, next week. I, I, will have, yeah. I, I will help him with it that's okay well i no need problem. to learn portuguese as well i i have my uh, my niece is brazilian so oh, I need yeah to, yeah yeah my my brother married a woman from brazil and so i have a beautiful niece yeah. olivia she will kill me for saying her name because i think her instagram will suddenly get lit up <laughs> but um i hope her account is private but no she's a young woman probably uh 
18 now or 19, I forget her age, but she's um, she'll help me with the language. Muito okay. obrigado, John. Thank you. É, espero que vocês tenham curtido. Obrigado, Thiago Quintela, por ter feito essa grande participação traduzindo a entrevista. John, espero te encontrar aqui no Brasil dia 21. Vou lá te dar um abraço, se você permitir, a gente conversar pessoalmente. E boa sorte nesse projeto. E você tendo sorte, nós, botafoguenses, também teremos sorte. Um abraço, deixem um like, inscrevam-se no canal e compartilhem esse vídeo em seus grupos do WhatsApp. John, tem que ser um inscrito no canal do TF também no Botafogo no Coração. Vou tentar ver o celular dele se ele é inscrito ou não. <risos> abraço, gente. Thank you, John. Thank you. Obrigado. Thank you.